So, Adam, thank you so much for coming to join me on this episode of Not Your Average Globetrotter. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And today I wanted to talk to you because you're an American, Italian American living in yeah. Rome and you've come here with your family and actually you're, you're trying to make a life for yourself here. But maybe rather than my introducing you and talking too much, maybe do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and who you are and what you do? You know, I'm from Rhode Island originally, uh, though I've spent most of the, the better part of the past 15 years uh, living in Boston. Um, I I went to grad school at Harvard and I studied Italian studies there. Um, that's where I met my, my wife, uh, who is uh, Spanish, and she was teaching Spanish there. So um, we were at Harvard um, working there and uh, had kids, and we um, realized that we wanted both kind of for ourselves and for our kids, uh, an opportunity to live a Mediterranean lifestyle. We wanted mm -hmm. our kids to be exposed to, um, not necessarily my wife's culture per se, but to, to Mediterranean culture. And you know, we both kind of f see Spanish culture and Italian culture is similar in a lot of ways. Of course there are oh, differences, definitely. but. Um, oh, you yeah, know, there's a lot of similarities between the two. It's, yeah. it's really quite shocking sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, we um, loved working at Harvard. There was, there was, uh, had very good jobs there. I was working as something like a dean of students in one of the undergraduate mm -hmm. residence halls. My wife was uh, a preceptor, which is a language teacher, essentially. And uh, she was teaching Spanish. And uh, we were sort of slowly looking at, at opportunities that uh, were arising in the study abroad sector, um, which is something that I was really interested in because it sort of united these these two passions I have, which are you know Italy and study abroad, and um, right. and also um, working with students. Um, so. I found a position, um, actually inter interviewed for a few positions uh, as dean of students, associate dean of students, these type of things, um, mm -hmm. at study abroad programs, and ended up accepting one at Loyola University Chicago's center here in Rome. And uh, it was just that. It was kind of what I expected in a lot of ways, uh, if, with the pandemic aside. Um, right. You know, it was working, <laughs> working with students uh, and really exposing them to, uh, you know, to Italian culture in a way that was, you know, really engaged. That's what I wanted to mm -hmm. do. Um, and so, so, so the work was wonderful. And, you know, my desire to do it, I guess, you know, jumping around a bit here, but goes mm -hmm. back to my own study abroad experiences in college, uh, which started uh, with a summer in Siena, um, which is where I, you know, sort of fell in love with Italy and then mm -hmm. continued after I decided to major in Italian in college with a uh, study abroad in Bologna. So I spent two semesters wow. in Bologna and um, they were just you know, both of them life-changing experiences. And that's something that I wanted to be a part of giving to other students. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess in a nutshell, that's, that's what got me here. So I, I think maybe for, for people who are interested in coming to Italy, that they would be maybe interested to hear a little bit about more about your, uh, the, the process from actually being a student to going back to your home country and yeah. then figuring out that way of getting work here in Europe. Was there anything in particular, maybe other than having like actually studied Italian in, mm. in university, um, do you feel that really helped you to actually make your way to come over here? Did the study abroad, the the, the study abroad program, did that really solidify interest from a from a, an employer, or were there any other factors in your past that allowed them to really say, "Hey, this is the right guy for the job"? I I, I understand what you're asking. I think it's an important question because I. I spent a lot of years uh, trying to figure out how do I get back to Italy? Right. Uh, you know, I really want to go back. And, um, it, you know, one of the things that I sometimes tell my students is that if they come here and they do this experience right, it's life changing, but it's not yeah. just life changing. It's the beginning of a chronic condition from which you never recover this love for this place um and it's always going to be pulling you back yeah. always going to be pulling you back here and even people that 
you know, I, I'm sure this, you've had this experience too, where people say, I've got, you know, five days in Italy, where should I go? Yeah. And, I, and, and my response is always like, well, you could go here, you could go there. It depends on what you're interested in. But just remember, once you go, you'll be back. Yeah. So no, don't stress too much about it. Oh, no, definitely. There's no recovering from that first trip. I, the, I remember the first time that I went abroad as a kid, a family friend said to me, once you go, there's no coming back. It changes your life. It changes yeah. everything around you. And it changes the way that you look at everybody around you back where you were. Things will be different. And it's not those people that have, that have changed. It's you that will be the one who's changed. Because once you take that first step, and I'm not even saying to Canada, because that's... I, Apologies to the Canadians out there, but it's practically America 2.0. Like, it's just, it's a carbon copy in some ways. I know I'm going to offend all the Canadians out there, but let's be real. We're very similar between the United States and Canada with some very, some noticeable differences. But at the end of the day, once you actually get to maybe Central and South America or over more so to Europe, that's when everything, your whole perception of life changes. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's 100 percent true, and I and I, and I agree that that's a, that's a change that occurs within you. It's not the people around you, but all of a sudden you're seeing them, and you're seeing your culture, and you're seeing yeah. uh, everything in a dif- in a different way, in a new light. And and there's no escaping it. There's just no, no. escaping it. It no, becomes no. part of who you are. I, I'm just curious because also your wife is Spanish, so I'm mm-hmm. assuming that this made it a little bit easier for you, or did that not end up holding any bearing uh, with being able to get a job here? That's a good question. Um, I, I, I think, you know, when you make a big move like this as a family, um, I would say it's it, it's a challenge. It, you yeah. know, it, even in a culture where you feel comfortable and you speak the language mm-hmm. as I did, um, you know, there is a period of culture shock that comes with that yeah. um, and oh, getting yeah. used to things and building a support network and, you know, uh, m- my 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 son Luca um, got scarlet fever shortly after oh. we moved here. I know who thought that still existed, right? And, yeah, wow. and we we're like, we don't have a pediatrician yet. We don't know who to ask what pediatrician oh to use. You know, so it was it was very stressful. Yeah. Totally not a big deal, but you know, when you don't have those resources yet, it's scary, it's stressful, and it's one thing after another when you first move to another country. So I'd say it's something that you can't take lightly. Um, but I do think um, I don't I don't know that that you know made me more appealing as a job candidate or us more mm-hmm. appealing as a package. But I think it did mm-hmm. facilitate our ability to do it, and you know, sort our sort of openness to having right. this experience with all of the, the challenges that come with it. Because I'm, I'm also just one of the reasons why I asked that is because being the spouse of a European citizen, that does give you the, the legal ability to actually stay here. And so yeah. was that difficult to try and organize once you got here or did you have to start organizing all of this even before you came? It, so that's 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 an interesting question. Um, my employer actually wanted me to get a visa, um, and uh, they uh, felt that that was important. I'm not entirely sure why, but mm-hmm. um, even though I had explained to them, um, you know, that I was eligible for 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 work eligibility through my wife, um, they wanted me right. to have a visa for reasons that uh, I think that were sort of bureaucratic reasons that that sort of facilitated the 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 transition for them. So okay. that's fine. Yeah. Um, you know, um, so what I ended up doing when I moved here was, um, I came here sort of on a tourist visa, uh, the 90 day tourist visa that, that Americans get was sort of starting getting oriented in the position. And then after 90 days, I had to return to the United States and wait for, uh, my new La Osta or entry permits no, to come right. through from the Italian immigration office. That wow. ended up being five weeks uh, in Chicago waiting for that to happen. And oh my goodness. Uh, it was actually the, you know, I told you the story about the scarlet fever. That was the day before I left. Oh, um, no. Yeah. So it was, it was really a very challenging moment and uh, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't care to repeat it. Oh my um, goodness. But, what happened was uh, the sort of um, 
the opposite the, the opposite end of this job opportunity that I've already told you about that I accepted right. and you know was um, really loving was of course the pandemic uh, the pandemic right. shut down um, all the study abroad programs pretty much and um, like most people I was I was laid off so I am trying to transition to the permesso di soggiorno for spouses of EU citizens. Now, I thought this was going to be super complicated to do. I couldn't get a straight answer because it's an unusual situation, right? right. You know, normally, you right. don't transition from get a work visa first and then, uh, right. you know, a permesso through your through your spouse. And, you know, I um, started emailing lawyers and, you know, saying, do I need to you know, can I do this? You know, is it difficult? I went to a, to a CAF, a Centro Assistenza Fiscale, to see if they gave me a good answer. Um, everyone gave me a different answer, which, yeah. which I think is not atypical of the Italian experience. Nobody no. seems to have the definitive answer to your question here. And yeah. that's an uncertainty that you learn to live with. But yeah. what, did I, what I ended up doing was going to the Questura myself and saying, what do I need to do this? And they, yeah. they, they basically said, make an appointment, uh, and I did, I came back, I made the appointment. I had every document known to humankind with me ready for any question that could come oh, up. Gosh. And they said, you don't need any of that. Uh, here's a letter with a list of five things that you need. Come back on this day with your wife and we'll get it sorted out. So that day wow. is uh, the end of next month and I'm waiting for that to happen. But it, so far, fingers crossed, it seems like it's going to be pretty straightforward. Well, yeah. You know, I, I had said to them when I went to the Questura, I said, you know, my, my, you're giving me an appointment for uh, two months after my permesso expires. What am I supposed to do in the meantime? And they said, well, um, you can apply for renewal two, two months before or two months after. So you're fine. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. You know, I, I guess I'll have to explain that if I ever get stopped by the police and they're like, why is your permesso expired? But the fact is, um, with the pandemic happening, everyone is aware of the fact that, um, you know, the, the wheels of bureaucracy are turning more, even more slowly than usual here. So uh, I'm not too yeah. worried about it. Wow. Well, you know what? I think I'd like to fast forward just one drop because sure. during that time while you were working for this school, you, you mentioned that you did get uh, laid off and that that yeah. was just a situation that ended for you. But after that, you did something that not a lot of people really have the guts to do or maybe because it was the situation that was just it was finally time. But do you want to talk a little bit about your hmm. school and what you guys do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this was um, sort of my wife's brainchild, really. Um, you know, when <clears throat> when we came here, it was sort of on a leap of faith because we came here for an opportunity for me, um, thinking, you know, something will come along for her. We'll find something that will work that will that will allow her to to you know um, f find sort of fulfilling professional path, continue her path, um, and you know, um, the more we talked about it the more we realize that what she is amazing at and loves and wants to do is teach. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, um, she has a way of teaching that I think is really effective and really original. And at one point, you know, as we were talking, I kind of said, maybe, you know, you just need to start your own. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because I don't know if you're going to find an opportunity to do it your way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, working for somebody else. And so, you know, this was originally something that, um, you know, she was going to work on building um, and I was kind, kind of going to be on the periphery. And then I got laid off and we mm. decided, you know, I, that we were going to both jump into this um, sort of whole hog and really um, try to make it happen. And so, um, what we came up with was Hill School. Um, Hill is uh, short for hybrid language learning, so Hill with a Y. Oh. And um, it's a school that uh, offers the languages that, that we speak and have taught, which are Italian, Spanish, and English. And we, um, y you know, had originally thought we're gonna we're gonna rent a place we're gonna open a, a brick and mortar school in the traditional mm -hmm. sense of course that hasn't been possible at all oh. um, you know so we've been trying to sort of um, roll this out really slowly um, get some online clients um, and that's what we've primarily uh, been doing so 
um, to, to, to start with. That's really awesome. Also, just to, for anybody watching this to clarify, this is not any paid advertisement. This is not a paid spot. Like I genuinely wanted to bring Adam on here to talk about what he's doing because it's really inspiring and it's very difficult to build a business in a new country and under the circumstances that Adam had to come and do it under. Uh, I mean, it's just I have so much respect for you and any small business owner building any kind of business or even pushing that business that they've already built because it's a day and night grind. It's something that has to be your baby and you have to really nurture it for, for all that it's for not all that it's worth for everything that it can be worth. Yeah. Thank you, Raphael. I appreciate that. Um, it's, um, it's a challenge and you know, I, we're gaining momentum, but we're not there yet. Um, mm -hmm. we, we picked the worst possible time to start a business. Of course we didn't pick it at all, but it is what it is. So, uh, and we're committed to it, you know, so we're, we're doing our, our best to make it happen and, you know, sort of coming back to what I was saying before about, you know, uh, comfort with uncertainty. Um, mm. Never could that be more germane than right now, uh, and never more than in Italy. You know, where yeah. again we're uh, we're lucky that we have nice neighbors and friends, and we do have a bit of a support network after living here for a year and a half. And so we've been able to get some answers to our questions. But a lot of times the answers are not the same answers. So yeah. you know, just trying to figure out, you know, what are the prerequisites that we need to open a school you know what are the what are the legal prerequisites how 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 high do the ceilings need to be well it depends on who you ask and sometimes they need to be this high but other times you can get you know sort of a you can get a waiver for the for the ceiling height and right. you know some people said oh just do it in an apartment there are tons of, of empty apartments where you could do it and other people were like don't do it in an apartment in an yeah. apartment you'll 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 be breaking all these rules and you'll have to get all these waivers it's not worth yeah. your time yeah. Um, so, you know, answering these bureaucratic questions in Italy is so complicated. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I guess in some ways the pandemic has saved us from that particular quagmire uh, since yeah. we can't really open uh, a school yet, although uh, or, or a brick and mortar school. Although we we do um, have a place that we're looking at that I think is going to work out. Fingers crossed um, oh, for cool. when for when the time is right. Well, in Boca Lupo, I hope it all Crazy. happens the, the way that it's supposed to happen. And, and uh, just uh, that's interesting. I mean, do you feel as though maybe looking back on things, being able to start out with an online business rather than fully invest brick and mortar is a good way of starting that type of business rather than just jumping in full hog? Or would you have preferred to be able to jump into the deep end? I, you know, I don't think of us as as traditionalists in the in, in most sense senses, um, but I do think there's enormous value in teaching in person. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at the heart of the way that we teach is engagement with the language, is mm -hmm. use of the language. It's communicative and post communicative. We want you to come in. You're you're and 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 you're speaking the language that you want to learn from day one, even if you have never studied it before. Um, and um, that's the way that we taught at Harvard, and that's what we kind of want to bring here. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that's a little bit harder to duplicate, I think, um, when you're doing it online, because you know I think the energy is different, right? You have oh, a definitely. group of people that are interacting. Um, it, it's not quite the same, but I think it can be done. I, I think it, 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 you know, maybe needs to be done in smaller groups. Mm -hmm. Then you can accomplish it. Uh, you know, if you're doing an in-person uh, sort of thing. But, uh, you know, I think uh, if we had uh, been able to open a brick and mortar school from the beginning, we probably would have wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the same time, and you know, I think the, the, in, the sort of instinct of your question is right. It's like in some ways, like it has allowed us to sort of roll out this thing in a way that is a little bit slower and a little bit more comfortable for us as mm -hmm. very, very new entrepreneurs. Neither right. of us has opened a business before. So this wow. is this is new territory for us, um, even though teaching is something we're very comfortable with. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, that's that one thing. Question? No, definitely. I mean, that's one thing that really can be amazing that you can be so comfortable in your field, but once you start going out to do it on your own, there's all those extra bits and pieces that have to, to, to come into place, even to go and how to register for taxes here. And I mean, to register that business or do you register yeah. as a sole proprietor or are you, and even the definition within the tax system of like, are you uh, a, a on a e-commerce website or what is it that you're doing? Because I mean, with yours, I can imagine there were so many definitions that you could have even gone to and that probably, I hope you had somebody helping you with this. Yes, yes. We have a commercialista uh, who's actually our neighbor oh, wow. um, <laughs> and she was kind enough to sort of walk us through uh, a lot of the questions we have and, and help us open Partite IVA, mm -hmm. um, uh, which you need, of, as you know, to be a, to be a sort of um, a freelancer of any kind. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, th there are a lot of questions. I mean, the tax stuff, we're still trying to figure that out. Um, and, um, we haven't gotten there yet because uh, this will be our first year doing our taxes in Italy. Um, mm -hmm. So um, all that is part of the adventure to come, I suppose. <laughs> so I guess we'll have to check in with you at a later date to see how that's all been because it's a wild ride. I mean, just just changing from an American mindset to a European mindset is one thing, but American mindset to an Italian mindset, this is a whole extra level. Has there been anything that maybe has really stood out to you? Because you did spend time in school here, but of course there's mm -hmm. a difference between being in that educational bubble versus actually doing it on your own. What would you say was maybe one of the biggest differences from that time to where you are now, other than having a family and kids? Uh, from my sort of study abroad experiences, you mean? Yeah, like what's that, that, that thing that really makes you realize, oh, I'm really living real life here in Italy. This is not just a, a fun study abroad experience. Maybe something that surprised you. Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think it's a, uh, you know, it's a, a lot of these little bureaucratic things, I think that, you know, make you really realize like this is real life. Like this is mm. not an extended holiday in any way, shape or form. You know, the fact that, you know, to, to declare residency, I, I had to go to the municipio six or seven times to actually make it happen. Mm. And, um, you know, of course, you're missing this paper, you're missing that other paper. You, you forgot to, you know, cross this T or dot that I. I was actually very lucky because I sent in, we had our, um, our residency request rejected twice. So I went in, of course, the, you know, the pandemic had already begun. So, but I went in to the municipio and, um, you know, explained this to the guy at the door because they won't let you in because of yeah. the pandemic. Yeah. And he said, oh, well, you want to talk to the URP? And I said, the URP, what's the URP? <laughs> well, it's the Ufficio Relazioni Publiche, so the, the public relations office, right? So what I go and I talk to the, I know, right, the URP. Um, so I go talk to this woman in the, in, the, in the URP and she's very, very nice. And as I'm explaining the whole thing to, to, to her, I'm overheard by the woman who processed our application. And she comes over and she said, don't worry about it, I'll talk to this guy. And like, <laughs> you did it, she was like, you did such a good job, you were, you were this close to getting it. Uh -huh. um, and she was, she was like, okay, like this is what you need to do, this is what you need to bring. You don't need to start the application over from the beginning. Just next time you come in, you bring this, you ask for me personally, and we'll get it done. Wow. And, and, and that's what I ended up doing. So, you know, there's was, there was some sort of, some luck and serendipity there. Um, but yeah, sometimes uh, in I, Italy, you just have to have that unique yeah. connection with that one person and not just be a piece yeah. of it. I mean, that's anywhere in the world, but especially in Italy. But sorry, I interrupted you there. No, that's right. I mean, I, it's, that, that's actually right. I mean, there's a lot of luck there. And of course, speaking the language makes such a difference mm -hmm. for that. I mean, in the way that you are treated and, and, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I, you know, I've been coming here for 20 years. I speak the language really well at this point. Um, and I, I think that does make a big difference to the way that, that, that I'm treated. I mean, people generally know I'm foreign or, you know, they're, they're like, you're not from these parts, are you? You know, like they hear something not that's not quite us. Italian. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but they can't really put their finger on it. So, right. so like that make that makes me feel 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 pretty good knowing that it's hard for them to to kind of figure. I don't have an American accent when I speak Italian. So, oh, that's awesome. Uh, I like that, but um, you know, so I think that helps. And 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 I found people again and again will say, "Oh my God, the bureaucracy in Italy it's so horrible and so mm-hmm. difficult." Um, most of my experiences have been good. Yeah. Really it's the thing is, it's at the end of the day, even though there are the annoying parts of it, if you have an understanding of how it works, then it becomes a lot less frustrating. If you approach the Italian bureaucracy from an American standpoint, then you've already lost. You have to approach yeah. the Italian bureau- bureaucratic system understanding it's the Italian bureaucratic system. And you yeah. mentioned such an important point that if mm. you even, in your case, you speak Italian perfectly, but... Let's, let's talk about my case here. I don't speak Italian perfectly, but mm-hmm. just if you take that, that step of trying to show that you are serious, that you are yeah. trying to learn their language, trying to speak their language, they will actually be so much more open to you and so much more friendly. Even I had the situation where I was in a comune and at the beginning of the conversation, I said, I'm sorry, but my Italian is really bad do you speak any English? And she said, no, I don't speak English. So she, we had, we carried out the, 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 the interaction in Italian. And as we were going on, she was like, okay, I see you're really struggling in Italian. Let me switch to English. And her English was like, perfect. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> and that's happened to me so many times. Even when I was talking to someone on Amazon and, uh, cause t- they, they, it was a, I don't remember if it was a live chat or if it was a phone call with the customer service, but, the guy said, I asked him, do you speak any English? Just because I was getting so frustrated with trying to get the Italian out. And he said, no, this is Italy. We speak Italian. I'm like, okay, buddy. Wow, Yikes. that's that's pretty heavy. And whatever, the conversation went on a bit more. And he was like, oh, wait, where are you from? I said, I'm from the United States. He's like, oh, in that case, we can speak English because it's your native language. I was like, what are you even, and wow. in the end, the guy wasn't even Italian. He was originally Egyptian. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, no, the, the, there are those little things that will happen here that if you do try and make that attempt, people will come and meet you halfway very often, yeah. or they'll at least want to come and meet you halfway. Even if they can't linguistically, they'll, str- they'll, they'll try to have some patience with you. Of course, maybe it'll change if you're in a bigger city, but you're in Rome, and it sounds like you have had those experiences of people ki- uh, trying to help you and, and meet you halfway in some way or another. Yeah, I mean, I I think um, Romans are, are very warm and kind mm. people. You know, the, there's... Uh, the, the, the bureaucracy in Italy is the bureaucracy in Italy, and that's the way it is. But I think if you approach it with, with good intentions and a good attitude and an extremely abundant helping of patience, oh, uh, yes. <laughs> then you can get through it. I, you actually reminded me of an experience I had once uh, when I was studying abroad in Bologna. I was in, I forget where, I, I had had, I had a, a train layover. It might have been in Reggio Calabria. It was somewhere, I was on my way to Sicily. With, my sis, with a friend of mine uh, from Sicily. And um, the I was trying to get a Carta Verde, which was a discount card for young people. I don't know if it still exists or not, but for the trains. Mm-hmm. And the guy at the train station was being so rude to me, and I didn't know why. <laughs> and, it's, and finally, he's like, okay, fine, give me your passport. Because so he, need, he needed ID. So I gave him my passport, and he said, wait, your last name is Miri, or Muri, as he said. Um, and I said, yeah. And he said, my last name is Lemura. We're probably relatives, <laughs> and, and he told me the whole history of the of the Mure Lemura clans and how they were originally Sicilian, but many of them moved to Tuscany. Suddenly, this guy wow. was my best friend. Oh wow! And it's funny how you know people in Italy want to connect. There's this desire to connect with other human beings here um, that. I haven't experienced or I haven't experienced in the same way in the culture that I came from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, And that's something mm -hmm. that I really, really love about Italy. And I think what, what, one of the, one of the biggest things that's kept me coming back, I'll tell you another story, actually. Um, I've always considered myself an introvert or at least someone who leans introvert. Mm -hmm. I need my alone time to recharge. I really do. I'm there with you, brother. (laughs) Yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. Yes. And... You know, my mom, who's a clinical uh, social worker, has is an introvert too. In fact, she's so introverted that she lives in the middle of the woods in Maine and loves it. Uh, and that sounds like a dream. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a beautiful place, and we love visiting. 
But the, she's always been interested in this sort of introvert extrovert dichotomy. And I had a conversation with her once, not too long ago, and I said, Mom, I think I have to reevaluate this idea that I'm an introvert because I go out in the world in Italy and I look forward to interacting with people in a way that I can't say that I did in the United States. Yeah, I, I, honestly, I can definitely relate to that. There's just something that is unlocked here. And it's just, it's part of the culture, even for somebody who does enjoy their time alone, there's something about life in Italy that makes you want to be outside. I mean, okay, we do live in smaller quarters than most Americans do live in. And and that mm -hmm. is part of the way that people connect here. Rather, rather than maybe like all of your friends coming to your home, you go out to the piazza, you go out to this place. And so it's not just that you're having an experience with your friends, but you're also out in the world enjoying the whole setting that's around you. It's it's more than just that. I'm, 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 it's definitely a subject that I'm curious to hear more about, uh, uh, this this idea of coming as an introvert, but then having that, that re-evaluated and re-explained. It's not something that I, 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 I mean, I, I, I probably never going to go out and say I'm an extrovert, you know, like what, yeah. what, no, I, I, what I don't I expect need. that. <laughs> yeah. But you know, the, there's something about going out into the world and interacting with people for an introvert that can be taxing. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it's not always that way. I'm not trying to speak in absolutes here, but um, it's tiring, mm -hmm. but, but a big piece of that, at least for me in Italy is lifted. Mm. And, um, I think that is really at the heart of what made me want to move here and live here permanently. I just love that. I love that. I, that, you know, people engage with me in a way that's authentic and mm. people, stop walking to talk to me if they know me on the street. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, Boston's a very frenetic city. People, everyone's kind of zooming by all the time. And you know, the people joke about this a lot, but the typical reaction when you see someone, you know, in Boston is to cross the street so that you don't have to talk to them. <laughs> um, not because you're being rude, but it's but because you have things to do and it's cold no, it, out, so yeah. you don't want to stop. Well, you know? even if you uh, look at it linguistically, the way that the people from from that part of the country speak is very straight to the point because it's cold. It's yep, nope, not yes, no. You don't take that extra time to actually finish the word. You need to have that uh, that interaction be very pragmatic. Exactly. Adam, if anybody's wanting to get in contact with you or learn about, more about your school and, and also what are the languages that you teach? Maybe if you can just tell us uh, just for a quick second before we wrap up, that'd be great. Sure. So uh, we teach uh, Italian, Spanish, and English. And uh, I taught Italian for years at Harvard. My wife taught Spanish for years at Harvard. And so, um, you know, those are the languages that we offer. You know, if anyone is interested in getting in touch with us, they can find us, Hill School, uh, H-Y-L-L -L School. Uh, on, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on Pinterest. And you can email us at hillschool at gmail.com. Uh, if you want to get in touch or contact us through social media. Well, perfect. Thank you, Adam. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us here today. It was really great connecting with you. And I look forward to being able to connect with you again in the future and bringing you back on here to hear those updates about what you guys are being able to accomplish. It's been my pleasure, Raphael. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And it's, such, it's been such so nice engaging with you in this conversation because I feel like we're, we're kindred spirits in this journey. Definitely. No, we're on that same page, man. So really, thank you so much again. <laughs>